Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. The Word of God. So I think David wrote it. It's very significant that David wrote it because as king, as God's representative, he is pointing beyond himself to someone who is close to God, but someone who is not king. Matter of fact, if I was going to preach on the Trinity, this is one of the places I would start. This is not a Trinitarian, this is at least a binary understanding of God. So we have deity here that somehow includes another personage inside its sphere. This is going to be a little more detailed in most of my sermons, but there's some wonderful things here. I hope you'll follow with me. I sometimes have a real struggle in myself. I, I listen to other preachers, and um, I'm sometimes, to my own shame, very critical of their theology. And yet at the same time, I listen to myself, and I'm very critical of the fact that sometimes I'm so content-oriented that I seem not to appeal to the whole man. I seem to come across a little dry, if you please. So I hope that as the Lord speaks to you through the grammatical and historical account of this psalm, that the reality of the presence of Jesus Christ with us and the magnitude of what he has done and who he is might somehow filter down into your spirits and your life. The psalm begins with the thing that's quoted most often, I guess, the Lord said to my Lord. Now, if you look at your translation, please, the first Lord there is in all caps. You can tell because the R is all caps and the D is all caps. The second Lord has a little D and a little R, doesn't it? Every time in your Old Testament that the word Lord is capitalized, or every letter is capitalized of it, means that what we're talking about is the covenant name for God, the name that God revealed to Moses back in Exodus chapter 3 when Moses said, Who shall I say send me? And God says, Say, I am that I am, or I am what I will be, or I am has sent you. The Hebrew word or Hebrew verb to be is the word Yadah, and this is the word Yahweh. It's a variation of the Hebrew word to be. It means that I am the existing one. And the Jew, because he was afraid to break the commandment that says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, he was afraid to pronounce this covenant name for God, so he pronounced the Hebrew word for Master, Lord, Adonai. So both those words are used here. And Yahweh says to Adonai. And so it's saying, God the Father says to the Master of David. So here we have inside of, of the being of God at least two personages, and you get it very clearly from the next verse. You see, the word says here is the Hebrew word that's always used for God speaking to a prophet. When it says, and God said to Nahum, and God said to Baca, and God said to Jeremiah, this little word is always used. It means to whisper in someone's ear. So the covenant God is whispering in the ear of the Messiah what he's going to do for him and David understands. Now, I really think that Psalms 110 is related to 2 Samuel chapter 7. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, David's getting older now. Uh, God reveals to him that one of his seed, one of his children, is going to have a throne that's going to last forever. And he's going to be a very important person in, in God's plan for mankind. 2 Samuel 7 is this weird, uh, not weird, but just it's Old Testament understanding of combining a historical person with someone who is above history and beyond history. For in 2 Samuel 7 it says, And God shall forgive all his iniquities. Now that's got to refer to Solomon because the Messiah doesn't have any iniquities. But also in, in that chapter it says, And his throne shall be forever and it will have no end. Now that can't refer to Solomon and it can't refer to the divinic throne because it ceased to exist. So that has to point beyond Solomon to someone else. Now, the psalm is the same thing. It points toward a historical representation in David's throne in, the, in, the, in Judah, in the tribe of Israel. But it also points beyond, to someone else beyond that. And listen why. And Yahweh says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand. This is the most oft-quoted verse 
in all the Bible. And the way it's quoted in the New Testament is, as Jesus rose from the dead, stayed 40 days with the disciples, then after 40 days on the Mount of Olives, he ascended back up into heaven. They saw a cloud take him up, and the angel says, you know, why do you look after him? He's coming back in the same way. And then Stephen sees him, not sitting, but standing when Stephen is martyred, and the rest of the New Testament says that Jesus is sitting on the right hand of God. A little girl came home to Sunday school, and the mother said, what did you learn in, in, in Sunday school? And she said, well, I learned that Jesus is sitting on, the, on God's right hand, and he can't move. <laughs> well, that's an anthropomorphic way of saying that God and Jesus are together. You see, if Jesus was just a good man, just a great teacher, just a religious genius, he wouldn't be sitting on God's right hand. He'd be prostrate at God's feet. For no creature is going to sit at God's right hand. But the very fact that Jesus is sitting there shows the equality between Jesus and the Lord. Now, please, uh, God has to be spoken of in terms that men can understand. I don't think God has a body that someone can sit down beside him. So these are, these are simply terms to try to get your mind to show the equality of, of God the Father and the Messiah and not a, a great throne in heaven and God sitting there with a long beard and Jesus sitting beside him. I think the only part of the Trinity that has a body or a corporal existence is Jesus Christ. When we get to heaven, we're not going to see a great throne with God the Father and Jesus and the Spirit. We're going to see Jesus, you see. He is going to be the embodiment of all that the Trinity is. So, when Jesus was standing before the high priest, the high priest said, uh, Quit talking in riddles. You tell me plainly. Are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? Jesus says, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And the high priest slapped him. Jesus has said as clearly to a Jew as he could say, I am God. Remember what I said to the covenant name for Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, is the Hebrew word to be, Yada. That's the word I am. And when Jesus said, I am, he was saying very clearly that the God of the Old Testament and myself are the same. It's the same thing when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. He says but that I am was before Abraham, you see. He was clearly linking himself to the God of the Old Testament. Then when he said he'd be sitting at the right hand of God, he was saying Psalms 110 refers to me. And then when he says I'll be coming on the clouds of heaven, he's saying Daniel chapter 7 refers to me, the Ancient of Days, you see. So he told that high priest with three unmistakable passages, Exodus chapter 3, Psalms 110, and then Daniel chapter 7, that I and God are one. And that high priest could not stand it. Notice then that the right hand of someone in the Bible is always the hand of power and authority of might. So when, when Jesus is sitting on the right hand of God in symbolic fashion, it says that the Messiah has the power, the authority, the right of God, if you please. And then the next phrase says, Until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. Now many folks have said, Well, Jesus is just somebody that God's using until uh, his purpose for him is finished. He just picked him up as an instrument, going to use him until the enemies are defeated, and then Jesus will no longer be part of the Godhead. I want you to turn with me very quickly to a Romans chapter, Romans, <laughs> excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 34 through verse 24 through 28 describes the until, if you would please. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 28. Then comes the end when Jesus delivers up the kingdom to God and Father, when Jesus has abolished all rule and authority and power. For Jesus must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy will be abolished is death. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is expected to put all things in subjection to him. And when all things are in subjection to him, then the Son himself will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to himself, that God may be all in all. I mean, that's a, that's a wild sentence to say. Jesus is going to hand the kingdom back to God when all the enemies are defeated. Because you see... Inside the Trinity, there is a, a distinction, a, a, a diffusion of power, a diffusion of responsibility. It's Jesus' responsibility to come to earth, to show men what God is like by walking among men as a man. 
He came to die in man's place that man may have eternal life. He rose again to show the power of God into eternal life. He was taken up to heaven and to the right hand of God, ever making intercession for the saints. He is the advocate of the believer. And then he's coming again with the holy angels and on the clouds of heaven to bring all that know him back to himself. But when he comes again, and everything is caught up in the fullness of who he is, and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, including the spiritual realm and the earthly realm, then Jesus, as an act of submission to the Father, will hand everything back over to the Father. So the until is not the until of temporal existence. It's the until of fulfilled purpose. And so the until there is till God is all in all. Now, notice it says, make thy enemies a footstool for thy feet. How many of y'all watch professional wrestling? Not the rest of you won't admit it. That is the fakiest stuff I've ever seen in my life. You know those guys 50 years old that weigh 300 pounds can't be in an athletic contest. You know that. But they throw each other around. Anyway, have you ever seen them where one guy just clobbers somebody and he puts his foot on you know? Well, in Joshua chapter 10, verse 24, the same thing is said about the kings of the Canaanites that were defeated by Joshua, that the elders came and put their feet on these kings' necks as a symbolic way of saying they're under our control. Now, that's what it means, make thy enemies thy footstool, okay? Now, notice it says in verse 2, rule in the midst of thine enemies. This word rule is a strong Hebrew word. It means dominate, control, conquer. Uh, man, it's a strong word. And it says, in the midst of thy enemies. Now, if this thing, this psalm, relates somehow to Solomon, then what kind of enemies are we talking about? We're talking about physical enemies. Because the word salvation in the Old Testament, it mostly speaks of physical deliverance. That's why all the psalms talk about deliver me from these evil men. But as it relates to the Messiah, it's talking about spiritual enemies. Going back to Ephesians chapter 6, it says, We wrestle not with, prince, with uh, flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and wicked forces in high places. Friends, there is a spiritual battle for the lives of men going on, and the Messiah is going to conquer. Matter of fact, the whole book of Ephesians and Colossians says that Jesus has overcome the spiritual forces in our world. Now, because these forces have been overcome, then notice it says, Thy people will volunteer freely in the day of thy power. Now, your translation probably has, they are willing, King James, Mine has volunteered freely. That is a terrible translation of this Hebrew word because the Hebrew word's plural. You can't get this translation out of it. But the Hebrew plural always means in the Levitical system a free will offering. It means that God's people will come to Jesus and lay their lives on the line for his service. They're going to come voluntarily and freely and put their lives on his altar for his use for whatever he needs, it's just like the Old Testament, Romans 12, 1. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable or spiritual service. It is the complete dedication of the child of God that's been touched by the ministry of the Messiah that comes and says, here is my life, it is yours, take it, I give it freely. And that's what salvation's all about. It's turning over our life to Jesus Christ by faith. It's putting our life alive on the altar of God for his service. That's exactly what the Messiah is going to do for his people. And then notice it says, In holy array from the womb of the dawn thy youth are to thee as due. Now this is terribly corrupt in the Hebrew. It's just, it's really bad. It's hard to understand. But the sense of it's there. The sense is, on one hand, it may be this, this holy array in the literal Hebrew is the beauties of holiness. Many would think that it refers back to Exodus 19.5 where Moses is talking about the people of God. He says, and you are a peculiar people, a holy people, a people of God's own possession, a royal priesthood. So many think that what we have here is the, the, the redeemed of God as they stretch out in thousands and thousands of people all dressed in the regalia and the vestments of the priest, an army of priests, a kingdom of priests. You find it in Revelation chapter 1, 6 and all through Second Peter just many times, this kingdom of priests idea. But I really think what we have here is not, a, not us all dressed up like priests, but all of us having the moral qualities that denote the people of God. One of the saddest things in all the world is that we talk with our mouth about how much we love God but we live with our lives as if there were no God. The church is full, not of theoretical atheists, but practical atheists. We say one thing with our mouth. 
We live nowhere in our lives, and it's the hardest thing in the world to win somebody to Christ whose lives have been touched by a fake Christian. So this says that we are going to live in such a way that our lives are going to be characterized by the beauty of holiness, which means not that we're going to live holy lives, not that we can transform our lives, not that we're going to live for God kind of commitment, but that God in Christ through us is going to make us more and more like him. So it's his power working in us that gives our lives the quality that goes along with our talk. Now, notice if you would please, in verse 4 when it says, And the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, Thou art priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, here we get into, into Hebrews chapter 5, Hebrews chapter 7, which you read, hopefully. Now, the Lord has sworn. This is a covenant word. The reason that we as, as uh, Western Christians in our age do not understand the Bible is we try to make the Hebrew Scriptures fit 20th century Greek thinking. We try to put a Greek analytical pattern on a Hebrew practical book and it never will work. We can't understand that way. The Old Testament is bonded together in a covenant relationship. It's not the individual thing that we pride American on, you know, I'll do it my own way, I'll, you know, this individual thing is a much later development. All individual Hebrews responded by faith, but they responded through a national covenant. It was a covenant between Yahweh God and, the, and this particular people, and there was responsibility to the people, and there was responsibilities on God. And the people kept breaking theirs. They would sin, and they would sin, and God would say, I forgive you. And finally, God takes them into exile because he loves them. He wants them to be purified from this idolatry. And so he takes them. He, he chastens them, if you please. But God is never conditional. God's love never wanes. So the covenants in the Old Testament are conditional on our part, unconditional on God's part, and so the word swore is God saying unconditionally, beyond a shadow of a doubt, you are a priest. Now, the little word, um, he will not change his mind, is the Hebrew word repent. Does it bother you that God is spoken of as repenting in the Old Testament or not repenting? Again, there's no way to talk about God without talking about God as if, we'd talk, as if we could understand about a man. So we say God repent or did not repent, meaning... This is God's will, and it will not change because God has swore it with an oath. And that's what the author of Hebrews picks up on. The reason you didn't understand when you read that seventh chapter of Hebrews, the reason it sounds so weird to you, the reason Vernon didn't write, read it is because there are parentheses there. That, that, is a, that is an example of rabbinical hermeneutics or rabbinical ways of interpreting the Bible. Y'all are used to hearing me. I am a particular kind of interpreter. I am a historical, grammatical interpreter of the Bible. That means the history and the, the way the original language is put together is what I base my authority on, and I try not to say anything that I can't base on history or syntax. Now, the rabbis had a totally different system. So they could go back to Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 and following, pick up on Melchizedek, and say this about him. Now, They'd say, since he has no ancestors, he, his father and mother aren't listed in Genesis 14, and since it never says that he died, then he lives forever and he is an eternal priest because he has no ancestors and he never died. Now, the man Melchizedek had a daddy and a mother, and the man Melchizedek died. But the Jews, in their system interpreting, took him as a type of a universal priesthood, and therefore he never died. And then they also say the reason he's a type is because his name Melchizedek, Melech being king, Zedek, righteousness, king of righteousness, and the place where he came from is called Salem or peace. That's the name for Jerusalem before the Jews got a hold of it. So they say his name means that he's a, a righteous priest. Now, this is real good. This guy, Melchizedek, is not a Jew. This guy, Melchizedek, is a Canaanite priest. But Abraham, the patriarch and the big dog, I want to tell you, of the Jewish faith, paid tithes to a Canaanite priest. Now, friends, that is a type of the universality of the Son of God because, you see, in Jewish understanding, Levi was way down the line, generations from being born. But in Jewish understanding, Levi was in the loins of Abraham and the Levitical priesthood paid tithes to the Melchizedek, and that's why Jesus Christ in Hebrews is called a priest after the order of Melchizedek because all the Jews paid tithe to him, meaning that he was a higher person. Now, 
Another reason why that is is because Melchizedek was both king and priest of the city of Salem. Jesus is the only one in all the Bible who is both king and priest, and so the typology fit, and the Jews in their understanding took that Genesis 14, built it in such a way, and wrote, and, and that's where the Hebrews came from. That's why it's very hard for us to understand. Now, Melchizedek is simply a, a type or a figure of Jesus Christ. Notice, if you would, please, when it says in verse 5, the Lord is at my right hand. Again, this idea of power and authority. But here, I think, as God, as Jesus is on God's right hand, so God is on Jesus' right hand. Now, that's kind of hard to do unless you've got a twister game. And so it's not talking about physical. It's talking about the spiritual unity between the Messiah and the covenant God of Israel. Notice it says here that he will judge among the nations. Now, the reason the Jews rejected Jesus Christ the first time is because he came as the suffering servant. Friends, I want to tell you, he's coming back as the judge. He's coming back with the holy angels. He's coming back with splendor and power. He's coming back on the clouds of heaven. He's coming back in majesty and might. And he is coming back as the judge of the earth. But the Jews missed that first coming and only saw the second. So they rejected him. I think he's talking about eschatological judgment, judgment, last day judgment. And because of that, when it comes down to say, in verse, the last part of verse 6, he will scatter the chief men over a broad country. It's not a good translation. The word singular. He will, he will scatter the head of a wide land. Now, I think that's referring to, maybe a bit interpretive on my part, I think that's referring to the man of lawlessness of 1 Thessalonians 4, 2 Thessalonians 2. I think it's referring to the beast of the Revelation. I think it's referring to the Antichrist of 1 John. And that means that Jesus is coming back to finally do battle with this manifestation of evil that's coming in the last days. And then finally, in closing, I want you to notice that in verse 7 it says, Therefore he will lift his head. After he has come as priest and king, after he has delivered his people from all the spiritual enemies they have, after they come and volunteer, and after he has set them free and set up a new kingdom, what you notice what he does? You see in your translation the last verse of this whole psalm. Look down at your Bible, everybody. Hope you got it open. Look down. You see the word his? Is it in italics? Is it leaning slightly? It is, isn't it? You got a Bible that's leaning. <laughs> when a, a word is in the Old Testament or New Testament is italics, it means it's not in the original text. It's, it's supplied by the translators to help you get an idea. But I don't think it ought to be there. He shall lift the head. Now that means in Psalms chapter 3, verse 3, in Psalms 27, verse 6, I don't know how many of y'all have children, but have you ever seen your child come to you with head down and like that? Well, you know he's done something bad. And he just, he kind of walks in, and you take his head, and you lift it up so you can see him. It's a symbol of forgiveness and love. As we come to Jesus and our lives have been shattered by trying to live for him and we can't live for him in this world, we sin over and over again, we come as broken vessels, he takes our down uh, cast eyes and he lifts them up to himself and says, it's all right, I died for you. All power and authority has been given to me. Or it may mean that as Jesus Christ fights the forces of evil, that he runs and does not grow weary, because he himself is, is, is uh, born on the wings of the power of Almighty God. And so therefore, in the midst of spiritual battles, he does not grow weary. He's a God that does not slumber and sleep, but all the things that God purposed for him to do, he can do and never bat an eye. Whatever. It's a beautiful psalm for the people of God about who Jesus Christ is hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born. Let me ask you today, do you know this one? Do you know this one that's predicted his life and death hundreds of years before he was ever born? Do you know this one who's changed the course of mankind and changed the history of the world? Do you know this one who's died for you and offers you eternal life and the free forgiveness of sin simply by turning your life over to him by faith? Do you know him today? Do you come to him with head bowed and eyes closed because of the shame of the way you've been living? Can you come to him and know that you're already a Christian but you've been living for yourself and let him lift your countenance again as, as a father lifts his child God wants to do something in your life today would you let him as we pray together Lord God we thank you for thy word for the comfort that comes that you really are in control of history and that all power and authority has been given to you 
We ask you today in the quietness of this moment that your spirit would have freedom here among our people in our lives. God, that if there's anything in our lives that's not pleasing to you that you might show us right now, Lord, as we see the majesty of your Son and his glorious work for us, we ask that if there's anything not pleasing to you that you let us give it to you right now. We ask you today, God, as Jesus has come as, as a priest forever, an intercessor on our part, a mediator on our behalf, that, oh God, if there be those here who do not know you, that today they may accept Jesus Christ as their perfect sacrifice for sin and, and rest in his completed work. In the name of your Son, we pray. Amen.